Hello and welcome, I am the Imprint, this is Crusader Kings 3, we are playing this game over on Twitch and this is what you're gonna see. And my goal is to teach you how to play Crusader Kings 3 as well because I think it's a fantastic game and it's super fun. If you've never played Grand Strategy, if you've never played 4X, if you've never played Strategy much, I think Crusader Kings 3 is a great starting point. Get it on sale and follow along with us and learn how it goes. Now. Other than other tutorials, I'm not going to explain everything that you see. Rather, I'm going to talk about what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, and the thought process behind it to help you better understand the game that way. Now, our starting date, uh, we're playing with the full suit of DLC. You do not have to, to enjoy it. Uh, but what we are going to do is we're going to play here in 867. And we're going to pick the... Um, Iranian Intermenso starting point. It doesn't have the text here, sadly, but you can see it over there. And we're going to pick one of these suggested rulers. And I like to start with someone who's a count because they're the lowest rung of what you can be. Um, I'm not... We'll see why he's hard compared to this guy being easy. If you don't want to play hard, you don't have to play exactly what I'm doing, for sure. It goes further. The only difference I have here is we're going to play as a clan ruler, which is different from feudal and tribal, which are the other versions. So some things are going to only apply to clan. I'm going to point out which, which is only clan relevant as we go. So Rostam is 21 year old, 21 years old. He has uh, a child and uh, well, I'm assuming that he's his child and he is the Dalamite culture i think at least that's what it says here in the text so we're just gonna go hit start and jump right in we're playing on iron man meaning we have a chance to earn ourselves some achievements uh but we only have that one save that is continually overwritten so there is no save scumming here which personally i prefer so if you really fail then no potentially your playthrough is over which might happen a lot when you really start out. So the start like this here is a little bit different than when you take a ruler elsewhere randomly in the world. Because this is part of one of the overarching story things. Which has its own little mechanics. That doesn't exist everywhere. But here it does. So let's read into it. Because I haven't played here since the release of this either. The Iranian intermezzo bloody civil strife embroils the once unassailable Arabian Empire. Ruling family murder and war with one another, competing to usurp the caliphate. Iraq reels whilst beyond the eastern mountains. Persian frontier lords take advantage of the situation and assert their independence. Building empires of their own from Baghdad's rubble. With the masters of Islam locked in perpetual crisis... Do I have to turn down the music? No, it's fine. Um, locked in perpetual crisis. Where is that? This is an opportunity like no other for the Bavandid house to become masters of their own fate and carve our name into the annals of history. We are one of the involved participants in the Iranian intermezzo, which uh, has its own thing. You can lock a tooltip in this game. Um... I have set it to clicking the middle mouse button. You can also set it to wait a little bit. And you can see the border kind of double up when I activate this. So if I have this activated, I can go into the tooltip and then go deeper into other tooltips. This is very important. Learn this because this is how you learn anything. So uh, we are currently in the phase of unrest. This is one of the phases in the Iranian intermezzo. Beset by rebellions and intrigues, the caliphate crumbles. Uh, is what we just read, basically. Uh, over time, unless the situation is resolved by an ending phase, the realm will enter a stabilization phase as desperate supporters claw back caliphal authority. Unrest effects? Okay, we'll figure all that out later. The region is currently in the phase of unrest. Your actions and those of other participants will determine the future phases of the struggle. Um, inspect each icon to view the current struggle effects. So... Where the current struggle is for war, that means the following. Uh, supply limit is plus 100%. Friendly territory level reinforcement plus 100%. So we can supply our armies longer and we will have 
quicker reinforcements of what dies. Um, to install loyalists, Kaz's belly is unlocked. So there's a way to war, wage war specifically for that. Um, offer vassalization removes the disloyal trait from recipients um, if it is successful. Okay. That's cool. So if someone becomes a vassal willingly, they won't be disloyal. Subjugation Caliphate spell is 20% cheaper for the holy of the Sunny Caliphate. So Sunny Caliphate Emperor can grow. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. We're going to not go through all these because, again, those don't matter immediately. So may Allah be with me. Let's go jump right in here. So first things first. If you zoom out, we are like right there. We, we live here, somewhere there. And the Abbasid Empire is big right there. They are an empire title. And we are just a little tiny little count. That's us. No, that's us. <laughs> um, if you don't know how you can tell who you are, your little flag has these side thingies. Your flag might look different from mine. Not just in the colors, but also depending on what type of ruler you pick. If you're a duke, then you have this little silver crown. If you're a king, you have this little red crown. And if you're an emperor, you have a very similar looking crown, which is slightly, ever so slightly uh, purple in here and not quite as red as it is over here with the king crown. Um, the shape of the flag also means something. If it's cut off like that at the bottom, that means it's a clan um, rulership, which we're looking at. If it's uh, like this here, that's a tribe. I think that is true for everywhere. Let's check over in Ireland. Yes. See if it has this little edged at the bottom, the three prongs, then that is a tribe. And if it goes like that, like a V shape at the bottom, that is a feudal ruler. So you can immediately, based on the shape of the flag, tell what you're looking at. That might not be all that important for now because we are really only surrounded by mostly other clan rulers. There are some feudal rulers over here which just work a little bit different. And feudal rulers are also a bit of an indication of what religion they follow because clan rulers are only really Islam and Eastern religions. Um, not all Eastern religions, but clan is mainly Islam, I think. But you can see here over where we have uh, Buddhism, and, and all that stuff, they are also this little V shape. So uh, feudal rulers. So clan, I think, is limited to Islam. Anywho, uh, so if you have your little flags, that's good. If you don't quite know exactly where you are, you can always uh, double click on the flag down here. Um, well, you could, should be able. Well, okay, you can't actually double click on the flag, but you can click on yourself and then the camera will move to where you are. Uh, this down here is actually you. And there's a bunch of stuff that is important. What is your own stuff? Has these blue little flags. So we own currently Amul and Philip. We're going to check that out in a moment. But for now, what we want to set up is our own character. And Crusader Kings is more so than any other, especially 4X game. Um, this is not a 4X game. It's a grand strategy game, but it's, it has similarities. And Crusader Kings is first and foremost about your dynasty, which uh, veins, grows and dies with your characters. And you always represent one singular character at one moment. But you have a family where you have children, you have a wife, you have all that. So it's a little bit like The Sims, but in medieval uh, Europe or, well, in medieval times in other regions of the world, of course, as well. So here is the role-playing element, kind of where you have to make some choices for your character, and that's actually where you start. Um, you need to select the lifestyle, which is basically uh, like a talent tree. That's the best way to, to describe it. You have these various uh, specializations, but one of these will have a little bit of a black box here, which says because of your something something education, in our case Marshall, you gain 30% more experience in this lifestyle. Now, lives are limited. You're going to die eventually, either by war or injury or just old age. Uh, so you will need to focus. Usually you will need to focus on one of these trees and try and unlock as much as you can. And that also decides your place now for the current ruler that you have. So we start as a martial ruler here. You might not, depending on your choices. Uh, but this is where we start. Now we can see for this specialization, the martial specialization, the uh, talent tree. 
And that is again subsected into three columns here, which all have different things. Now, since this character is also a certain age, he already unlocked a few things, which we could reset at cost of being quite stressful for us, which we're not going to do. But you could reshape this if you so desired. We have to make a focus choice here, which will then uh, start our learning experience bonus, basically the one that we're being promised uh, at the front there. That's baked into how much experience we get down here. So if we looked at another one, we don't get 37, but 27, because we do not have that percentage bonus that we have for Marshall. Uh, picking this does not influence any of the columns. They are related. Like over here is the gallant column, which kind of relates to the chivalry focus. Um, but you needn't pick them together. Like you can pick from any column, basically, if you have points. Uh, and you can fix it with any focus. What focus you need to take, it is very circumstantial. And I think you shouldn't stress it too much. Take whatever sounds kind of good to you. If you have literally no idea what any of this means, um, my best guess and suggestion is they usually, all of these have one option right at the top, usually, not always at the top, for spiritual, for example, is in the center, where you just get a plus three on Marshall, for example, or plus three diplomacy, or plus three stewardship. That is the safest option. Because the, the trait that you get, the main trait here, that is the most important for whatever you're choosing here. That makes you the best at most of these things, basically. It goes a little bit deeper than that. But if you're really new and you don't know exactly what all the other things mean, you take the one that is just base plus. And I'm going to do the same. I'm not going to talk about what I think without doing the same thing. So I'm going to take this. I know what the others are doing. But we're going to take this as a safe bet. Nothing can go wrong with picking this for now. Again, we can pick any column. Doesn't matter. It doesn't need to align. Even though we have the strategy focus, we don't have to build in strategist once we get a new perk point. So we pick this. Now you can see your values down here. We went from 15 to 18. Very good. And we can close this again. For now, we don't need it. It'll become relevant again once we go up. What you could do and should do potentially is read into what you have already unlocked. Um, for example, what we learn here is we get a little bit more power. The prowess is different from your martial skill. That is how good you are in direct combat. Whereas your martial skill is how good are you overall in handling military things like levying your troops, um, how many troops you can even have, stuff like that. Uh, so reduces the risk of commanding armies this is very good. Because this score here is important for how good of a commander you are. And if you want to lead yourself, that's dangerous. You might die. Um, but uh, this here reduces the risk. Your knights do that. And we get the courtship perk. So if we do a romance power sch uh, a scheme and a lope romance scheme, all these are more powerful, basically. We might not do it, but we know it's there. We don't necessarily understand what it means. Also doesn't matter. We'll talk about it once it comes up. So we close this out. Done with that one. Uh, sometimes we have potentially an item. You can see down here in your inventory a little number, maybe. So we're going to check it out. And we see that we have an illustrious regalia. The Sassassinian uh, sword, which is unique to this character. You probably don't have that. Uh, so that's great, because look at all the green text. Generally... In Crusader Kings 3, green plus is good. Even if you don't understand it, green plus plus high, uh, plus high number, good. That's how you can, can, can navigate everything. If you don't know exactly what a thing is doing, take the choice, pick the thing with the most green and the biggest green numbers. 90% of the time, that's the right choice or a better choice of the choices you're being given. So we're going to equip this. We're not going to... I don't think we're going to see it on our character personally. But um, we have it equipped now. So we get all the little uh, bonuses here. Which are pretty, pretty good. Number of knights plus two is really, really good. Knight effectiveness. So how good are your knights even? Plus 40%. So you not only get more knights. They're also better. Amazing thing. 
Uh, these are following more or less the same name, uh, color and importance scheme as your RPGs usually do. So this is a really good one. Uh, really, really good one. You can also tell by how, um, how long it's going to keep. Because these items have durability, they will degrade over time. But this one will last 150 years before uh, something bad happens to it. Which is an indicator of its quality. So this is really, really good. It's a great start making us a quite strong and formidable person. Now the next thing is, uh, what you can look at is up here, the current situation. Here you get, you can open this with tab as well. So pressing the tab key on your keyboard. I do recommend moving around with WASD because a lot of the things that you need are right around there, like the tab key for this. And this here tells you a whole lot of stuff that you need to know about your current situation. As it says, current situation right there. Um, so we are not employing a court physician. That we should take care of. So we click on that and immediately new th things open up. Um, we're looking to employ a court physician. All we're looking at are two numbers, basically, or three, I'm seeing. We want to see their aptitude. Ideally, they're better than terrible. <laughs> uh, we want to see how high this green number is, or the red number, how low it is. The higher the green, the better. Um, this position here, it has this little uh, exclamation mark. The court physician, because he's in direct charge of your health, keeping you alive with medicines. Um, he is very powerful. If someone tries to kill you and they convince your court physician to help kill you, ah, you're in for trouble. So ideally you want someone who doesn't hate you. We're not going to take Akbar. Akbar hates us. So instead we're going to take our court imam. Um, we could take our father, who is terrible, but he loves us. The thing is he's 72 and he's near death. He's not going to live long. So we could put him in. He would immediately die, basically. So instead, we're going to take our court imam and uh, hope for the best there. It does cost us a little bit of money. So we lose 0.1 gold income per month. Uh, the game is real time. You can pause and do whatever you need to do while we're paused. We are paused right now. And we're earning... 2.2 gold per month at the moment. So if we add this, we're going to earn 2.1 gold. That's fine. The court physician helps us stay alive. Uh, we sure want that. So we're going to close this out now. All good. You can claim your leisure's title. You can control uh, You control a majority of the counties that is sure to one of your leisure's titles. That means you can spend prestige to get an unpressed claim on it. That's pretty good. And I think also kind of unique to our situation. Because we're a count... But we actually control two counties. If we have more than one heir right now with the succession, how it's probably going to be like for us. We're going to check right there. Uh, yes, we have impassive succession. And that says all children inherit. We'll, we'll read on that exactly because honestly, I don't know. I haven't played clan in a while. Um, but our realm might split apart. So if you have two children, this Amul might go to another one and then we have a smaller realm. Unless we get a higher title, which is our first goal. We need to get a higher title. We need to grow. We need to find some allies to help us grow. And we need to get a higher title than count. So we want to become a duke. So this is interesting, but not immediately interesting. We're not going to look at that. We can station men at arms regiments. We're going to do that. Click on it. The window opens as it needs to. And we can see here two red texts unstationed. Now these boys are soldiers that are a little better than your peasant rabble that's going to be raised as our levies. You can see up here our maximum number. We can have around 650 soldiers. And this is set up from 444 levies, so your basic peasantry. And our 100 pike and our 100 bowmen. And our few knights, of which we don't have enough. Like, we have five out of seven. We could click on that and see if there are more knights that we could have. And we can. We can just click force, force, force. So all these people that we're forcing now will be knights. And basically, the best knights will serve. So who has the highest number here? High prowess. They will fight. This man here is a guest. We can't make him fight unless we pay for him to stay at the court. We have very little gold to begin with, so we're not going to do that. 
We can also see up here the Azbar effectiveness, 124%. Why? Because the holy site in Mecca is giving us plus 10. And because we got that sword. So they are much better because we got that sword. Yeah? If our knights fight against knights who are not as effective, our knights will win. They're going to be better than that. So that's great. Now let's station our men-at-arms because if we station them and we just have to click on this little button here, uh, they become actually stronger. And you can see if we station them in Firim, they gain plus six point something attack and plus 12 defense. That's amazing. So we're going to put them there. Now we're going to take our archers and station them as well. Now, we're going to put them in Amul. They're not going to get as much as they would get in Firim. But since our pike is getting far more out of being in Firim than the archers would, this is fine. Make sure you station them. You need to have a holding with a blue flag. If you don't have a holding of a blue flag or not enough, it's fine. The red text will only appear and the information will only appear if you can actually station them somewhere. And it will highlight on the map, as we just saw, all the places where you can put them. And what the effect it would have. So if we look at these guys now. We can see they get plus 6.6. .6 and plus 12 from being stationed there. And you can change it if you want. Later by just clicking on your troops. Selecting where they go. And it's fine. And under here you can see the full amount of their power and might. So the archers are pretty strong in attack. And our pikemen are pretty strong in both. Attack and defense. Very good. We could declare wars 10. We're not going to click on that for a moment. Uh, our brother Sorkab, who can marry, uh, can marry and he's second in line. Second in line means if our first in line, our son here, our player heir dies, we're going to become this guy. Uh, welcome, good evening, Asokanto. Uh, thank you for the follow. And good evening. I'm explaining the game, so if you have any questions, feel free, ask away. Otherwise, sit back, relax, enjoy. Also, this is a recording for YouTube, so don't be confused by doing things. Uh, by how I approach it. Anyway, so um, since he could be our heir, if our actual heir dies, it's very sensible for him to also generate heirs. So if we become him, if we die then there are children to get through. Uh, you know a good amount of the game. Very good. Lovely. Uh, you're also welcome. <laughs> Everyone is welcome. So you play like eugenics or what? Oh, no, 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 no. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't mean max at all. That's one of the uh, draws of um, my approach to this. Like, since I don't mean max at all, I don't care. I, I roll with what's given. Um, I think I'm pretty uniquely situated in helping people learn playing that game. I know. I know. Um, eugenics, breeding people for traits. I don't do that. Uh, if a good match comes around or no good matches are there, I'm going to try for a good trade, sure. But I don't... Like, that to me is min-maxing. Trying to go for the best traits. Trying to... Create the very best possible character. That's to me is min-maxing. I, I don't really care for it. Um, so no. I'm just going to try and explain the game as we play it. So um, that's really what we're doing here. Trying to get people into it. And I think trying to understand. Hey, you can do all these great things. You can be really, really powerful. I think th there's too much to go through uh, to, to get into that early. But it's, it's worth mentioning, of course, when picking... Uh, a wife, which we're about to do well for our son anyway. I mean, going for a lowborn with beauty, you can have in character reasons why you went for that. Absolutely. I agree. For sure. I'm not doing the full RPG approach either. So um, let's try it here and you'll see the approach maybe. So we want to get our second in line, our brother, a wife so he can have uh, many children. And now we need to make a choice on what wife to get them. Personally, early on, we are a count. We need power. So early on, if you're an independent small ruler or even a ruler uh, vassal, doesn't really matter. I think v alliance power is like the most important thing to look at. You want to sort it by alliance power because you want to see and make sure that you get some decent 
allies that you can l leverage for your wars. So um, now this has immediately changed. And um, there are some young people here. So if we allied with these guys here, we would get 882 soldiers extra that we could call in, which is nice. But they are a bleeder. Uh, so there's a chance that they die early because it gives a severe health penalty. And this is a inheritable trait. It's congenital. So there's a chance that his children will be bleeders too. Very strong alliance for our size. But that is a no-no. I'm not going to take that. You know. Uh, so instead we're going to go for the next best option here. Uh, and if we click at that we, we kind of jump around. So this is a bit far away from where we are. Again we're right up here somewhere. Whereas they are down there. So they would have to travel very far to help us. Not sure if that's a good idea. Does your brother have a lover? I don't think he does. But we can check. Relationship, no lovers. At least none that we know of. Um, so, who knows? <laughs> Let's see. Maybe we can find someone who's a little bit closer. And yeah, that is a little bit closer. So that is more interesting for us. Um, and they are barely different in, in their military power. Maybe they are even closer. And they are indeed. Look at that. They're almost right next to us. So that is... We're losing about 100 people. But they are close enough to actually support us. And do something. And she is 10 years old. So in merely 6 years. She is going to be able to marry. And start having children. So you wouldn't... With women. Like the age difference between males and females can be larger. If the male is the older one. Because women eventually... As in real life, in this game, they lose their ability to have children. Uh, or safely have children. Whereas men tend to be able to sire children pretty much to the end. So we're going to take the 10-year-old Kurdish girl here for our brother. And we're gonna, just going to send the proposal. If it says they will accept, that's perfectly fine. Uh, might want to tell them about Fekin. Yes, of course you can. Okay. I don't want to go into the whole uh, explanation of all the things you can do in picking a wife. I'm not going to go into that. Um, what I'm going into is the things, like my reasoning for what I'm doing right now and what I suggest people do early on. Yes, you can try and throw in the traits, the positive inheritable traits. You can do all that. But I don't think it matters early on. Especially if you pick a very early uh, save game as we are. We're starting as earliest as possible. Uh, there is not a great variety of characters out there. Uh, so chances of finding something really great are super limited anyway. And I think the most important thing early on if you want to grow, if you want to build your, um, if you want to build your empire, is get a decent alliance going. And that can come at the cost of other things. Especially since this is just our brother. So he's a he's a backup in the line. Like, ideally we never have to fall back on him. Ideally. Uh, so this will be a decent alliance and a decent match. Um, so we'll take it. Nothing has happened just yet. We have to unpause for the game to get this rolling. There's going to be a message being sent. We're going to receive a message back. Uh, so all this has, has to wait a little bit. But... Uh, we only have employing, we're not employing wet nurse. Now we could do that to improve how good our children are. These are not our children, how good our children are. Uh, I just clicked, uh, pressed F1 on the keyboard. That goes to your own private personal view of you and your family. Um, a wet nurse can help. Uh, it changes your court grandeur quicker. Doesn't really matter. But reduces the chance to contract illnesses. So that's pretty good. It's pretty good. And possibility for child development demands, uh, events is increased. So you have a greater chance of influencing what your child is going to be like. Um, but it costs 0 0.25 gold. That's a lot of money early on. So I tend to not employ a wet nurse early on. So next thing we want to check out is our heir. Let's have a look at him. Because there are some choices to make for him as well. First of all, he's one... That's fine. His health is fine. All good. Nothing special here. He has no interesting traits. Besides being our heir. And uh, what we want to make sure is two things. We might want to find a spouse for him. Maybe. 
Um, but we definitely want to set a education focus for him. So we're gonna take something that appeals to us. Now, we personally are martial focused right now. And looking at his traits, he is learned. But he has some prowess. Uh, which is because he's bellicose. That's an ethos thing. I think that's from our culture. Um, so we could lean into what he already has. Or we go into what we think might be important down the line. Like what will he have to be good at? Will he have to be a good soldier? A good general? Or will it be fine if he is more on the learned side? Now all these are viable. You, you can play with all of these. No problem. Personally, I'm not going to take Intrigue, but um, all of these are viable. Every single choice here is okay. You can deal with every single choice here. We're going to go with Marshall for one reason. Our main lad, who we are right now, is also Marshall. So if we take his education under own direction, that's going to be a good fit, basically. And looking at our situation, I feel like there's going to be wars. <laughs> uh, we're going to have to fight a bunch, so... Uh, I think having martial focus is sensible early on in this situation. You might pick different and again, it doesn't. It won't hurt you. All these are fine and viable. Next, we can get him a spouse too. Now there's two options. You can arrange marriage or you can find spouse. If you click on this button there, big find spouse is the same as right click find spouse. Difference being arranged marriage is only within your realm. So, we only get this option. So, it's a much smaller sample size. If we click Find Spouse, that is a larger. You can filter this down. And um, Aso Katano uh, in chat, you can see uh, Twitch chat up there, uh, did point it out. You can set, for example, the traits filter to Inheritable. And then you look for the green ones. And he specifically pointed out Fecund. So, if you take one with the trait Fecund, their fertility is plus 50%. And the life expectancy is high. And the years of fertility is higher. So a woman with this will have children... Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, so what she pointed out, uh, a woman with this trait will be much, much more um, longer able to have children and will have more children overall. This can be good. It needn't be good. There are some reasons why it could possibly be bad even to have a lot of children. Uh, but we're going to get into succession thing in a moment. Uh, for now, what we want is a woman that's not too much older than him. Because again, if the, the woman is much older than the man, that's a problem because they lose their potential for fertility sooner. So we can add another thing here. Up here it says age difference. And we're going to set that to 5. We don't find anything because there are no eligible... Ladies, <laughs> um, in his age range, plus minus five, uh, who are also in uh, in charge of inheritable traits, or who have inheritable traits. So we're going to remove that part. We're going to keep it at plus five, plus minus five. And we're going to set it again to alliance power, because we can't find someone with in good inheritable traits. We're going to get someone who's going to be helpful for us early on. Um, so let's have a quick look again at, at where these are. Darn. Why can't I? Okay. If you hold CTRL and then double click, then it just doesn't open everything, but you actually jump to where it is. So that's a little bit, eh. Um, that's too far away again. It does highlight on the map as well, but since all these windows are kind of overlapping everything, it's a little bit difficult to see. So I'd like to double click and just kind of... Get a feel there. So I think everything that's tribal is probably going to be far away. You can see again by the flag shape that these are all tribal. Uh, so here we go. There you can see it highlight over there, right there. So that here might be better. It's a small alliance and she's spindly. So we don't want a red congenital trait. We want to avoid those for sure. Um, so let's see. This is... Uh, where is this? I can't see it. So we're just going to CTRL double click. Uh, that's that's a little bit too far away for what they offer. So in this case, because we have to go quite low in terms of power and quite far away, 
We might still take someone who's further away who can't help us as bad as well. Um, but they bring more troops. Why? They needn't necessarily bring the troops into a war. Just having strong allies will dissuade others from waging war against us as well. Plus, if you just manage to hold out long enough for an ally to arrive in your war, doesn't really matter how far away they are. So we're going to go with the two-year-old Bedouin girl here. And we're just going to go ahead and click that. Again, if it says down there, we'll accept, it will accept. I've never seen them reject if it said we'll accept. So that's for the current situation. And now we can unpause the game. Uh, first things that are going to happen are pop-ups for the marriages that we just arranged. So we unpause by pressing space bar. And then now you could see for a moment these turn green. Now they are red and gray striped. That is if an event that is currently ongoing is preventing you from unpausing. Right now I can't unpause. I can't tell the game to go. It says right there, red text, pause by event. It doesn't exactly say what event, but it's the one that is currently popped up right there. Uh, so, to the Amical Rostam, I gladly accept your betrothal pro uh, proposition. Your son and heir, Sherwin, will be betrothed to my daughter, Saba. Very good, excellent, lovely. We accept that, thank you. I mean, that's what we want to do, so uh, we absolutely accept that. Um, and this is the other guy talking about um, our brother being betrothed to his daughter. Lovely. So, now... If we press F1 again to see our own uh, view, we can see we have two alliances now. These guys here, uh, we should be able also see them on the map, maybe, possibly. I know, they are part of other realms, so they don't really uh, jump out at us. But, doesn't really matter. We see we have two allies who will support us in our wars. Most likely, anyway. There are some reasons why they might not, but most likely they will t uh, they will support us. And this is how you do diplomacy in Crusading King's Ring. is familial bonds. You don't just, like in most other Grand Strategy or Forex games, you don't just go ahead and... Um, yeah, we'll check out the secondary ones in a moment. Thank you so much. Uh, you don't just accumulate some weird ethereal points that you then spend. You have to make these relationships work. That's how you do diplomacy in this game. And that's how you undo diplomacy as well. Because the way a d alliance is made like this, it can be unmade as well. If one of these sides dies, so if our son or their daughter dies, the diplomacy is done. The, the, the alliance is gone. And you can also end enemy alliances by killing people who are the reason for the alliance existing. So this is a very important bit of information if you're looking at your enemies. Uh, who, need to, who do you need to kill? This one or this one to end this alliance. Uh, now, we are being told for, uh, by Azo Katano. Or the father dies. Um, yes, but then you can renegotiate the alliance. So, Generally, you could. Sometimes you can. Not always. But, uh, yes. That's also a way. You, you can, of course, uh, if you're trying to weaken your enemy, you can just flat out kill your enemy. You don't have to fiddle with trying to break an alliance. You can just kill them. That weakens them for sure. <laughs> um, all right. Secondary wives. Due to our religion and our culture and everything, maybe just to our, due to our religion, we could check, but we're just going to live with it. Um, sometimes there's polygamy. So we can have secondary spouses. Sometimes we can have concubines or spouses. There's a difference. Children of concubines have a little bit of a negative modifier, whereas secondary spouse children are legit. Like, they're just as if they were your first wife's children. So now, we can become even stronger here by looking for women. And we could go ahead and set some filters. But we're going to start again with the alliance power because it's the most important thing. And we can only see two. Now, these are very weak because they are not counts, they are barons. These are these are small cities or... No, these are both cities, actually, because it says a republic. But it's a barony tier. You cannot play as a baron. But barons exist everywhere. So, we could get some small alliances in here by getting these two women. It's... Again, it's not much, but together, between the two, it's 300 men extra in a war. That we wouldn't have without them. So we're just going to do that. We're going to take both of these girls. And then we're going to look at someone more interesting. 
uh, like Azo uh, Katano suggested. I mean, I already see one that's that's great, but let's um, just for the fun of it, let's set our traits here to inheritable. And now we have a good amount of selection here. This is a good selection. Now I'm not going to sort by relevance anymore. I am going to actually sort by age, I think. Uh, so we're going to sort by age. And if you click on this, you can ascending or descending switch. We want ideally a young one, potentially depending. <laughs> and depending on what? On our succession. So another thing we need to understand to be successful in creating things, and I think it's actually the most relevant information that you need to understand. Because it's different from any other game out there that is in this realm, I think. Um, succession is a real important information. So we're going to look at that. You can press F2 to open the first window here. And then go to the tab succession there. It's a little bit hidden. Or you just click on the little realm crown here, the green one. And then you have a lot of information here that is probably not going to make a lot of sense to you in the beginning. And we're going to click on the change thing. We can't change anything, but we want to see everything that's going on. All right, so we are a clan, so this is different from what you're going to see as a feudal lord, especially as a Christian feudal lord. This is going to be um, confederate partition, partition, high partition, and then you have uh, primogenitor, ultimogenitor, and seniority. These are two lines that you're going to have. They're a little bit different. We only get the primogenitor, ultimogenitor, and house seniority lines. And since we're a clan, we get these options here. Now, what does any of this mean? It says right here, but it might not be super clear sometimes. I, I think it's sometimes unclear. Even worse, in the um, in the partition ones that I just described, they, have, they cut off the text even. Like, it's just dot, dot, dot there. But we have impassive succession right now. What does it mean? It means under impassive succession, the lion's share of the titles will go to your player heir. The rest will be divided between your children. What is a lion's share? That's like a cooking recipe being put in a dollop of butter. What is a dollop? Right? Um, so right now we only have one air, so we can't see it. But over here, in this section down there, it would tell us what exactly it meant. So if we have another child, it's going to show us which title goes to whom. But it doesn't really matter all that much, really. It's a, it's a good succession type. To start out with, it's a good succession type, for sure. But it doesn't matter too much. If we get another child right now, which is very likely with our, all our many wives, then our realm will be splintered. Because we only have two county titles. And we cannot, as a count, basically be like, okay, um, one child gets this county and the other gets that county. And um, the brother is going to be vassal to the brother. You cannot, as a count, have other counts as your vassal over your death, basically. So you need to become a duke to keep your realm together. But because of the gender law, it has to be a male and male. Yes. There's another thing. Um, our gender law over here, very good spotted, uh, kind of decides who can even inherit. And out here, it's male only. It's not male preference, which you usually have in the Christian world, where a woman can inherit if there's no male heir. So this is dangerous, very dangerous. Because if you manage to get more children, but they're all girls, you're, you're kind of you're kinda in a pickle right there. It's, it's, it's a bind. It's a problem. So you might want to decide on having many children, even though it could splinter your realm. But we're going to work on preventing that for sure. Uh, so back to our, <laughs> our wife selection. We could go, for example, for pretty. That also brings a fertility bonus. Which is very nice. Um, and it's less so than fecund. So maybe maybe we take the beautiful one. The pretty one. Or we go with someone intelligent. Who is just really helpful overall. Which will then improve our lineage overall. So the green traits. You want them as much as possible. That helps you. Definitely a good thing to do. So let's see. Uh, of, based on all of what I've said. Uh, Aso Kantano, what, what do you think? What should we pick? Should we take the pretty one or should we pick uh, the fecund and quick one? 
I would say these two are the best options because we want some fertility, but potentially not all of it. And if we have to choose between fecund and fecund and fecund, of course, we're going to take the one that has another good trade. Fecund and quick one. All right, very good. Then Avize, uh, the 17-year-old who could... <laughs> she looks a little bit older, but I think that's just because she looks so angry. <laughs> but that's fine. So we're going to send this proposal. And that's all done and good for us. All right. So we have taken care of our many wives. Let's unpause real quick. So they all come in with their acceptance of our proposals. Very good. Excellent. Very good. So now we have a few more wives. And our own military strength actually has gone up a little bit. Interesting. All right. Good. So the first thing we want to do is reach a duchy title. That's the very first thing we want to do. And in our situation, uh, we could claim our liege's title. So let's click on this. And it says, okay, claim liege title, but it's grayed out. If you hover over it, it tells us we're missing 1,049 crowns, which is prestige up here. You can see that there. And we're earning it at a very, very slow pace. So... Uh, getting to 1,500 prestige from nearly 450, uh, that's going to take us a bunch of years to get there. So we'll have to go about it a different way. Basically, we're not we're not gonna we're not gonna push it like that. But this would only be getting the claim. Uh, we might be able to wage a war there. So if we click on you can declare wars, we get a good nice list of all the wars that we can declare. For example. Uh, we could attack this guy and use the war causes belly conquer county. And I, I, I really suggest you do that early. Um, look at what you can do before they start getting their alliances in. Right now they have zero allies. We have four. And we're much stronger. Now keep in mind when you attack, it costs you prestige to call your allies depending on what size of ruler they are like calling in an emperor who is an ally will cost you a lot of prestige like 750 whereas calling in a count uh, will cost you much much less if you're defending in a war if someone attacks you calling in your allies costs you no prestige whatsoever because that's what friends are for <laughs> right um so what we want to make sure here is that if we attack somewhere we have the upper hand right now we are stronger than him, even without our allies. That's usually a good thing. Try not to start wars that you can only win if your allies are helping. Because alliances can break. If they're already in the war, that's fine. They're not going to leave the war. Unless it's a holy war, potentially. Um, but if they're already in the war, they're going to fight it through with you. But if the alliance dies before they can join the war, well, then you're out of luck. Um... And make sure you have the prestige to even call them. So it would cost us 85 to start the war. But if we wanted to rely on an ally to win that war for us, we would calculate that we need prestige to bring them even in. So that's the problem. Also check the gold. Make sure that you have at least more or even gold. They could use their gold to buy mercenaries. So their strength might increase. We know mercenaries are very expensive. Uh, we, you can check that if you press F3 uh, or go on the military tab here and then check mercenaries. You can see how much they cost. 111 gold are the cheapest. So no one at this point is going to be able to bring in some mercenaries. So that's not a problem. So if we click on him again. This looks good. This looks good. We have more gold. We have more troops. We have more allies. We have more everything. So we're good. Something to remember here. They might gain allies after we start the war. And they can call in allies after we start the war. So, careful there. Careful there. But I think we're going to chance it. And we're going to start our conquest war here. Why though? <laughs> Let's go into the why real quick first. Again, I said we wanted to become a duke. There are several ways to get that. We are right now part of a duchy. We have a liege. So this guy here, we are his vassal. 
He is our direct ruler. We're part of this. If we click on our own flag, we can see this golden line. Go to our leash. This guy doesn't have a leash. He's independent. But we are not independent from him. So if we attack this, that will then become ours, but also his. It will increase his duchy because we're not going to pass out of his duchy just because we conquer something outside of the duchy. But it will make us stronger. So we have a better chance of getting that duchy. Also, um, there are ways of creating your own kingdoms later. Uh, for example, here we could form the Sultanate of Rum, uh, which we don't have any of the options for it yet, but that's not a problem. Uh, what we would, could also do is we could click down here on the duchy titles thing, or press Shift Q. And then we can see all the duchy titles. And something we notice right away is there are some that are like slightly translucent with a red border, and some that are with gold border and, and they're fully visible. So the ones that... We, have a gold border and are fully visible are the ones that exist. Those are the duchy titles that already exist. The red ones with the border do not exist. They could be created. And if you create a duchy title as the um, vassal of a duke, you can't do that because you have to be independent first, but that's another matter. First, we need to be able to even create a duchy title. We learned that we could get a claim on it. Because we control enough of his duchy title, which is this one here, and we control half of that, or more than half of that. If we click on it, we can see um, not the information I wanted to show, so we forget that real quick. Um, but another way to gain a duchy title is to just get pieces enough of one that hasn't been created yet. So what we need to do for this, the duchy of Dailam, we need to own two of the counties that are part of it. And if we go back to the county view, or over here, we can see which exist. So this guy here, which we could attack, would be one. And the other two are within the realm of our liege. And as far as I can tell, if we look at him, he owns both of these. So we would have to attack our own liege to get pieces of this to create this duchy title. This is going to be cheaper and more affordable and more doable for us than the other one. But there was another duchy title here. This one. This one, you also need to hold two de jure counties of that title. And if we look at that right there, our neighbor here, he does. He controls two of these. So, if we can declare war against him, it might be more sensible for, do, for us to do so. But we cannot, because we have no reason to fight him. We could create us a reason, uh, and then go like that, but... Uh, that will take time and resources, so... Okay, now we have identified some ways of getting our duchy title. There are some more outside here, but that's going to be more difficult. So the most reasonable ones for us are this one, and that one, and the one that we're under. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to strengthen our position. We're going to go attack uh, this guy over here, who holds some bit of the duchy of Dailam. So that's very good. So press E on the keyboard or click on this realms thing here to get back to the reg uh, regular view, the view we use the most. And uh, we're going to go ahead and start this war. We can afford it. We are stronger for now. We have allies. We have enough prestige to call in allies. So we should be fine. We start to clear war. Loud noises. Uh, war has been declared. A new flag shows up down here with our war score and this little button, raise all armies. Now, armies are raised on these flags. If you press F3 or bring up the little military thing, you see your rally points down here. You can have a bunch of these in your own holdings. So if we click on this again, it'll show all the green areas where we can put another flag. We don't really need that at the moment. The one that exists is fine. So we click that. Or we just click raise all armies. If we have only one rally point, raise all armies will rally them right there. If we have multiple, raise all armies will raise it at your at closest as your at your capital. So we're just gonna click that. And our army will now gather. They take a while to get to the master point. To get ready for fighting. Took a day. And now they are here. Um, we are personally leading our army, 
And you can see down here the command advantage. That's important. 33. So due to um, how the clan, how the, Iberia, the Iranian intermezzo is working right now, we get plus 5. Um, we get plus 5 from leading our own soldiers because we are their actually ruler. Um, there are actually some more. And we get plus 18 because we have this very high martial skill. And now we're just going to send our troops with right click. We select them. Green little banner here. We click on that. You can see the red banner because that's where they were raised. And they carry that with them like good little soldiers. I'm just going to send them over to where we see his capital. Now you can see his border is blinking and glowing red. And it is also dotted. The dotted area is what you need to conquer to win that war. That's what you're about. That's all that's uh, going on. So we need to take his main city, which where he has his soldiers standing around. Um, and it's a little bit dangerous for us, honestly. For two reasons. The geography matters a lot. A whole lot. So he's standing in mountains. You can see in the tooltip down there it says terrain mountains. And you can see it on the map as well. Like that's very mountainous. So he will have a good defensive position. You get, when you move your armies closer, you get this little indicator here. Potential battle. That is your best friend. That is your best friend early on trying to understand whether or not you're going to win. This is not a guarantee, for sure. Because, especially if your enemy has allies, you need to make sure that their troops might not jump in and change this. This is just a projection. Uh, but here you get an idea of what's going on. So, his most positive bonus in this battle is he is defending in mountains. But we have a better commander. We have more commander traits and we have more soldiers. More soldiers is the weakest of these. But better army commander is very big. And more commander traits is also very big. But defending in mountains is also very big. So we're going to take it because we will probably win. And you can see we're going to arrive in a few days. Our troops will march through these different baronies here. Each of these tiles that I'm highlighting right now is a barony. And the whole thing that's highlighted here, that's a county. Now, here is a river. That matters, actually. Because if our troops go over there, and the enemy would be standing here, we would be attacking across a river, which would then be a red thing for our army and a green thing for his army. But defending in mountains is the very best thing he can do, plus it's where his city is located. So, uh, or rather his barony, his castle is located, not his city. So he'll stand there and defend. It's his best defensive position. And we're going to seek and look what's going to happen. Our father just died of cancer. Well. Alright. I'll zoom out a little bit to reduce the noise. And now we're going to talk about what's going on here and what we're seeing. So uh, we have our armies left and right. Um, the blue one is good for you. Basically. And the red one is your enemy. And um, what you want is to fill this bar up fully blue. You don't have direct influence over it. Only with what troops you send, what commander you select beforehand, and what your unit composition is. So um, this game has a little bit of a rock, paper, scissor type, um, counter, counter uh, type situation for your men at arms, which are your tra trained troops, your good troops, not the levies, but the real lads here. So our pike and our bowmen are down here. And the pike are green. And the bowmen are just regular size uh, color. Because the pike are fighting in favorable terrain. You can see here. So they are actually doing more damage. If we look at them here. They would be doing 28, 38. But here they're not doing more damage. But they have a better toughness. Because they are fighting in mountains. But so does, uh, does his spearman contingent. But they're weaker than ours, so they, even with the bonus, only have 28 toughness. The archers are unaffected either way, but our archers are much, much stronger. If you can see, ours do 27 damage. Well, okay, not much stronger, but 25 damage versus 27. So ours are a little bit stronger. Um, and we see a bunch of stuff here. So this is just kind of goes through the various stages of the battle. Um, this is slightly important. Slightly important. You can very barely see. Like this is its own circle. This thing has an oval around it. The bow and the sword. And this is its own circle again. If an army gets destroyed in the first circle. In the maneuver phase. It's fully eradicated. 
the army is gone. Everything is, is completely routed. Nothing is left. Um, so that can be dangerous and also reason why maybe one of your armies fully vanished. If you manage to get through the, through the maneuver phase and then lose or win, whatever, um, the enemy army might be routed. Uh, and then they retreat to somewhere safely and then they can try again. Right now, we're seeing down here this little percentage advantage thing. And the number we see is basically each point is 2% extra damage. And if it's minus 8, it means he gets plus 16% damage right now. That's all it means. Uh, and the direction indicates for which side it's favored. This depends on the advantage of the commander, the situation of where you're fighting, all that kind of stuff. And since he's defending in mountains, well, he gets a greater bit of advantage. You can see down here, their advantage is 41. Because the defending of mountains gives plus 12. So while his commander is worse than ours, down here, 23, due to fighting in mountains, that is a big, big, big bonus. Now, we have a lot more troops and our commander is not that much worse than his, even with his advantage. So we're still going to win this one, despite him clearly having the advantage. But it's, it's a bit dangerous. Um, you can see down here how many troops have been routed. Doesn't mean they're dead, just that they have left, less, left this particular battle already. And you can see the quality of the troops. Um, the higher quality troops will always remain to the last because they're just much better. And thus your enemy army might become a superior quality troop, which actually means a lot. But in this case, we're still going to win. And that will be that battle. Now, after the battle, you get a little after battle report and we're starting a siege. But let's look at the battle report first. We can see here, first of all, our knights are very strong. They killed 80 people. His knights killed more, but there was also more to kill. Uh, whereas we didn't lose any knights on either side. Now, the levies, you can see uh, they don't kill a lot. They mainly die a lot. Whereas the bowmen and the pikemen, well, they... Do, do both. <laughs> Whereas our pike did much better. They lost far less than his pike. Now this you can go through the, through the phases and see how they went. Like the main phase is where they actually fight. And the pursuit phase is when the enemy starts running away. Then how many people might you kill? And we only killed like three levies when he ran away. That's fine. So overall he lost 202 men. We lost more. We lost more. Um, but uh, we're left with 796, he is left with 454, he's not a threat to us. And we get some nice war score, and some fame and devotion, so our prestige goes up, our devotion goes up, our piety goes up, um, and uh, the war score goes to 50%, we're going to talk about that in a second, because in here, in our war, we're now 50% to where we need to be, but the battles are capped, if you're attacking, you can only get 50% maximum war score out of fighting. So even if you fight him 10 times now, it's not going to change it. What we need to do to win is capture terrain. We need to occupy his holdings. So we now have to do a siege, which immediately starts after his troops are being pushed out. So we can now see the siege here. We can see it takes us eight months to the siege to be over and hopefully to be won. Each siege phase here has a potential of generating an event. And you can see he's attacking us again because he has no other choice. We're still winning, but he's still defending because he's still holding this. So we're not going to get the mountain defending uh, advantage. He still has that. But due to having much less troops than us, it's still likely to go into our favor. Uh, one of our Valiant soldiers has managed to wound the enemy knight, so that's good. His army is weakened by a wounded knight for sure, because that knight is now much less effective. Um, one of our knights even maimed one of the enemy uh, knights, also very good. And, oh, look at that, joyous, joyous, joyous. Uh, he was leading his armies as well, and we captured him. So, the ruler of this land, personally, he's now our prisoner. And that immediately gives us 100% war score. So, we won this war, basically. 
So now we can go and enforce our demands. Uh, we will get some fame, which goes toward our family, our dynasty. And we get some prestige, which goes toward us. 75, that's pretty good. Uh, well, the allies share that. We might get some as well. Uh, but our allies had any joined would get 75. None of them did, so that's fine. And we're just going to enforce demands. And now, with this victory, we gain all the contested titles. And now, we can see, we can disband our army. Immediately do that. Be sure to do that. Click on that. Disband armies. I forgot to tell you, by the way, while your armies are up, you should press F4 to bring up your um, your council and set your marshal to organize army. Outside of battle, right now we're done with war, you can put him to train commanders, so he's going to improve your knights and commanders. Very important. Uh, but during war, do this, because he reduces how much your army costs while they are raised. And you need money, for sure. So I'm going to click Disband Armies. And that's that. That's our first war won. Now Dailam is ours. There are more considerations to make after this. Like, this will have fairly low control. Uh, we might want to deal with that. Um, we might be over our domain limit. We are not. We have 3 out of 3, which we can hold. Perfectly fine. And we're a little bit closer to being more powerful. Um, powerful enough to do something. If you click at this, what you just uh, got, you can see this little lock icon here. Saying, oh, these people, they don't like you so much. And you can see the control here. It's very low. And low control means you get less money out of it and less troops. And that's bad. We want troops and money out of this. So um, you can also put your marshal to increase control. Which we might do. But, oh, <laughs> thank you so much for the sub. Welcome. That's great. Appreciate it. Welcome to the court. Um, thank you. Right. So, our chancellor or marshal isn't really good. He has only a 10. He's average. So, there's a chance of bad things happening with what he's doing. But that's for all sections. You kind of have to live with it early on. You don't have a much, a very great selection to choose from. So we put him on control and he's going to do that for a bit. That's very fine. Control generally raises itself, but he's just going to push it quicker. So you have a quicker uh, way to get more out of what you just conquer. And that's warfare for you early on. Try and find people who are weaker than you without you needing your allies. Make sure you have allies. To defend against others, you know, with the eat or be eaten world. Um, and then try your best. And the next thing you want to do is get a higher title. So that's what we're going to work on. But for now and for today, that's going to be it. I'm going to end the YouTube recording right now. So if you're watching over on YouTube, thank you very much. I appreciate it. If you're watching over on Twitch, we're going to keep going a little bit longer, I'm sure. And... Um, Thank you for watching. Maybe consider coming over to the Twitch as well. It's kind of fun here. And you can ask your questions and give you input live immediately. Isn't that fantastic? But if you have any questions over on the YouTube, comments are free. Let's go. Let's have them. Like and subscribe. You know the drill. And see you around next time.